It's hard to follow the act of uh, investiture and Howard, uh, who's made such an impact in the field. But I think Howard introduced one of the key features is that there's so many avenues in Alzheimer's disease, and how do you get the resources to pursue them when most funding is related to basic research or directly clinical research, but not the application? Howard said we really learned a lot from the biogen study. Well, we did learn a lot. From my standpoint, we understand that the configuration of the amyloid cascade hypothesis as the linear aspect is definitely not the case. Um, that doesn't mean that amyloid isn't important. I think I will talk about that in the presentation. But it's important to know that Alzheimer's disease over the last 30 or 40 years has involved thousands of investigators maybe 60,000 investigators for the last looking at science metrics, 130,000 papers, tons of funding, et cetera, and yet in terms of drug development, there's been 99.6% failure rate. What studies I've been involved with, uh, studies on amyloid, been involved in studies on oxidative stress, which is probably the thing I'm most known for, mitochondria, et cetera. I'm just going to give a snippet in 15 minutes of some of the things I'm involved with, which will show how complicated Alzheimer's disease is. So we wanted to understand oxidative stress. So how many of you take vitamin E or vitamin C? That's a fairly good number. Why you're taking that or why you're eating vegetables is to change your oxidant balance and uh, suppress. Because just as when you're eating food and it's oxidizing through your body, that oxygen is also reacting with your body and causing it to rust, just like it does rust iron. So we looked whether this was happening in Alzheimer's disease. So before our studies, there was no documentation of there being any oxidative abnormalities. And what we found during those studies is that the oxidative abnormalities are not restricted to tangles and plaques, that they actually involve neuronal cytoplasm, and they involve every type of oxidative modification, whether it's lipid peroxidation, fats turning rancid, or nucleic acid oxidation, which is an underlying cause of genetic abnormalities, or um, protein oxidation or sugar oxidation, which is the basis of uh, complication to diabetes. All of those occur in all the neurons involved in Alzheimer's disease prior to them developing any tau abnormalities. And this led us to look what, what could be within cell bodies and neurons that be put at risk for the disease that was abnormal because oxidative abnormalities don't come out of nowhere. They come out of changes in mitochondria, changes in free metals, et cetera. So we looked at that within neurons that look absolutely normal. Where's the my book? Back there. Back there? Okay. So we focused initially on mitochondria Mitochondria are the little um, structures within most cells of the body. In fact, all cells are red blood cells. And they, um, they're the ones that produce 90 some percent of the energy that we use in the body. And there had been prior studies that suggested there was some abnormalities. But what we did is we looked at them at the cellular level, individual cells, the ones that had oxidative abnormalities, to see if they had mitochondrial abnormalities. And we did this by looking at mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria have their own DNA separate from the nucleus. It's a over there in the upper right hand corner is a diagram of a mitochondrial DNA. We made DNA probes to look at it, and what we were able to do is to look at mitochondrial DNA if there were abnormalities in it. And what we found was that there were abnormalities in the mitochondrial DNA, such as a deletion. But the more profound change we found is there was an increase in mitochondrial DNA, about three to four fold in Alzheimer's disease. And this was not restricted just to DNA. In the lower panel, you can see a protein, cytochrome oxidase, also increased three to four fold. And some of the prosthetic groups of mitochondria, like lipoic acid, also increased three to four fold. And this was a paradox because it had been reported and we confirmed that mitochondria can be exactly used in Alzheimer's disease. And what we did in between, we did a, a biopsy study 
um, and actually counted the number of mitochondria in a human brain, found that there was a reduction in mitochondria. And the reason there's this reduction is because the mitochondria are not in mitochondria, these components. They're actually in degradation pathway. So neurons in people with Alzheimer's disease are filled with mitochondrial components <coughs> and not in mitochondria. And this change, which I won't show here, actually begins when people are in the forties. That you can see as a normal individual. And this is an electron micrograph showing in situ hybridization where mitochondrial DNA is for those little nanoparticles, which are 20 nanometers in diameter, gold particles. And those structures are degradation structures for lysosomes, and they've accumulated mitochondria in the products. To understand why these changes occur, we actually looked at how mitochondrial dynamics. We looked at two aspects. We looked at mitochondrial transport in and out of the neuron, because neurons are really long. You have neurons in your body that are nearly three feet long, and those all the proteins are made in the cell body and they're transported wherever they're needed. And that's down in the lower part of this figure. And we looked at the tracks they move on. Those are reduced 90% in people with Alzheimer's disease. And then the upper part, which I'll show a little bit more of, is that the mitochondria also are extremely dynamic. And they're either fusing all together and becoming thread like structure throughout the cell or becoming little particles like in the left. We looked at the proteins that control this process, the fusion fission proteins, the upper part of the graph, and we found that there was a tremendous change in the protein profile in Alzheimer's disease versus control, specifically in the neurons that have oxidative abnormalities. And we demonstrated in a cell model that this actually changes the dynamics of mitochondria, looking at how mitochondria recover when they're bleached. That's in the upper curve. If you take a cell in that little region and you zap it with a laser light, you actually can watch the recovery. And if cells are um, Alzheimer-like, it takes longer for them to use together. So the dynamics has changed. Both transport has changed, um, fusion fission is reduced, and um, then that one percent here also their turnover has changed. So why does this relate to what you want to know about? I'll show you a couple of other slides. But this probably this process correlates the mitochondria accumulation of garbage directly correlates with the amount of oxidative damage with an R squared um, correlation coefficient of over 0.9. And we're modeling this in cell models. Initially, we did the work in fibroblasts, uh, which showed the same changes. Skin cells taken from people with Alzheimer's show the same changes we see in the brain. Not so great according to their health state. So we've now taken those skin cells and we turn them into neurons. And we're doing those studies right now. You still see some, and even though these cells have been reprogrammed, they still show the mitochondrial change. So this part of the talk is if we think, well, these are observational, then it normally mitochondria is spread throughout the cell where the cell needs energy. And neurons use a lot of energy to move all the ions and information that's being transmitted. Remember, a neuron is a lot like a transistor and a computer, receiving information, deciding whether to transmit that information, and that requires energy. Mitochondria supply that energy. And the, the mitochondria is attributed, like in the upper part of the world. In Alzheimer's disease, instead of being distributed like that, we've actually shown that they're poorly distributed. Many of the mitochondria are disjunct and it surrounds the cell body, which is not the part where the energy is really needed, at least not so much. And down the axons and dendrites, there's bigger distances between them. Do we think that plays an important role for why neurons don't support synaptogenesis? Because you'll hear more about the Dan Alton. Okay, where does all this fit with the amyloid hypothesis? And uh, for those that know me, I, for 20 years I've said the amyloid cascade hypothesis was unlikely to be the cause of Alzheimer's disease. That doesn't, but over that same period, I've studied amyloid extensively. 
because the genetic studies do show that amyloid must be an important player in what happens during Alzheimer's disease. And one of the reasons why there's this change in the transport proteins, etc., is amyloid. If you modify amyloid, you actually change the fusion fission proteins. Well, if we look at oxidative damage and the extent of it, and we look at people with uh, we actually see a strong inverse correlation with amyloid. We detected this a little over 20 years ago, and that's when we started questioning the amyloid hypothesis very seriously. Because if it was causing everything, why was there reduced oxidation? So in the upper panel, this is actually Down syndrome, and I'm showing it for simplicity, on the same thing for Alzheimer's disease, is that if you look at oxidation in this teenage individual, you see the neurons are blue, that's marking uh, oxidized RNA. And if you look at an older person who's 61 years old, you'll see that the neurons you can't even see them. If you actually correlate these two things over there, you'll see that the oxidative damage occurs five minutes, right? Okay, I can do that. Is that the um, oxidative damage is the first change that occurs during death. Down syndrome. It's the earliest change that occurs during Alzheimer's disease. And once you see amyloid, you see the inverse relationship is shown on the lower right. Same thing is seen in Alzheimer's disease. Always an inverse relationship. Not a uh, So when you're looking at this, now how does amyloid fit into this? Why would it cause a reduction? The basis for the oxidative damage we see is most likely metal metabolized oxidation. The neurons in Alzheimer's disease accumulate redox active iron and copper in the cell body. And this was an assay that Mark Smith and I developed a number of years ago to look at redox activity um, within cells. And what we found was, and this is comparing Alzheimer's disease versus control, is that Neurons in Alzheimer's disease have an incredible amount of ability to oxidize and produce iron. And that type of reaction is very similar to that we talked about earlier. To understand the mechanism of that, we isolate <coughs> plaques, which is one of the components within the structures I just showed. And we, these are isolated plaques, A, B, and C. A is with Congo red, um, and it's a bioprinted structure, has a Maltese cross form, uh, aims with amyloid antibodies, and B, and C is with control. And what we found was that the plaques actually didn't have iron binding attached to them. It was kind of paradoxical, but did have copper and um, when we did random spectroscopy. So why do we look at both these metals and understanding how they're organized is because copper and iron are so redox active, they are the ones that would cause the wide range of oxidative damage to it. And what we did is we found that amyloid beta actually reduces the ability of copper to cause oxidative damage. In other words, when iron and I mean, excuse me, copper and amyloid bind together, the copper is no longer acting. It's acting as an antioxidant. And that's what's shown here when you have the amyloid beta with it with a ratio of one. In other words, one amyloid bound to uh, one copper, there's no oxidative damage. So then we want to understand how is the iron organized and how is it propagated as we So the simple explanation would be that the copper is bound to histidines, and that that's acting as some type of redox center that had lots of oxidative damage. And the iron, we didn't know where it was. So we looked at isolated plaques. These are thin sections through isolated plaques, which have been stained by a different type of method. In fact, in this case, we're looking at the intrinsic uh, electron density of carbon, which is not typical for electron microscopes. And as you can see, this I have things marked with little dots that are white. That means that they have a lot of electron density. And those dots, you can, this is, we looked at them. 
them with an atomic resolution microscope, and we were able to see that they were magnetite crystals. So instead of being bound to the amyloid, these iron were present meshed within the amyloid as little iron crystals of magnetite. And you can see that this is angstrom uh, organization, so most of the iron, well, all the iron we detect in these crystals is pure magnetite. And it has, um, yeah. it has magnetic properties, um, which is not a trivial thing to demonstrate because it's not directly magnetic, it's super paramagnetic. Because magnetic properties are dependent on the size of the particle. And these are right at a transition, whether they have real magnetic properties or paramagnetic properties or no magnetic properties. We're now, uh, okay, so then we also look at how the copper is organized. We know it's dispersed, dispersed within the plaque. And we know if you take plaques and you chelate copper, which is being done here by a couple of people, well known chelators, that the plaques actually fall apart. So the copper must be there, localized there, and it plays some role in holding together plaques. But we haven't been able to map the amyloid. The binding site within the from the actual plaques where we are with synthetic tech. So we're still working on this mainly through a mass spectrometry approach. Synthetic peptides bind amyloid very tenaciously, not surprisingly. What it looks like, our current theory is that when they form the folds themselves or structures like plaques, that some of the binding sites are lost. So this led to the uh, idea that instead of looking at amyloid data as the cause of the problem, that they may be clearly part of the responses to the problem, but really critical responses. Much like inflammation is, and that doesn't mean that you're always playing a positive role either, just like inflammation, you can have too much or too little. And therefore, the amyloid-related therapeutics could have value, but not, not the approach of just removing it, which is where the vaccine has been saying it's all bad. Because it's playing some role, I think it's important to note, I wanted time to go through, that neurons that change during Alzheimer's disease don't die immediately. They live at least 20 years. That's not really good. Change is not optimal. Well, I gave a talk about amyloid deposition, oxidative stress. I could have given a talk on 30 different things that we did. And I think, and all of them can make great arguments that they're important in the disease. But you know, if you correct any one of them, we already know for most of them, they don't do any better, thing better than the amyloid hypothesis. So I think this is really saying that Alzheimer's disease is a multiple, it has multiple hits, much as how it said earlier. And multiple things are really fitting in the aggressive care approach. I'll see the changes multiple things. Okay. This is some kind of slide if you can match. Just look at all the different approaches that are being used right now. Now, I'm sure, this is not even a complete list. And where do, where do you get the capital to pursue all these ideas? Not just that all the money has been going into the amyloid cascade hypothesis, the really well done studies, but there hasn't been money to be able to pursue with all of the intermediate things to be able to do phase one, or more importantly, the phase two studies that will get people to the next level of interest by the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. I won't present a summary then. I'll go to this last piece. To stimulate um, new ideas in Alzheimer's disease, the Jim Trussard, who founded the Oscar Fisher Project, is offering a $2 million prize for the best idea of the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And I welcome everyone here to apply. I can give you some documentation on it um, because we really need new ideas in the field. It isn't just the 30 ideas I listed or the 100 ideas that are out there, but we really need to pursue a lot of them. And Alzheimer's disease is really joining the ranks of other chronic conditions that are multifaceted. 
and aren't treated just by removing amyloid or removing tau, but maybe a collection of different things for different people. So I think this, this way of investment that Max has come up with is one way to address that, that multiplicity of approaches. So thank you for being here and thank you for listening.